The African continent was an absolute hotbed of fighting during the Cold War. As the old colonial empires of Europe receded, two new empires reached out across the globe to take their place, championing new world orders based on either crony capitalism or militant communism. One place this conflict infected was Southwest Africa, now Namibia, where the South African Defence Force fought a 23-year-long war that, in the minds of many, has been forgotten. In this video, we tell the story of the South African border war and Namibia's struggle for independence. Like so many modern conflicts with colonial origins, the best place for us to start is the end of the First World War. Southwest Africa had been a German colony until 1915 when it was invaded by South Africa, which was then a British dominion. After the war, the region became a League of Nations mandate. However, as South Africa was a powerful and developed neighbour, they retained administrative control over the territory. When the UN superseded the League of Nations in 1945, they requested the South African government apply for a trusteeship over the territory. The South Africans won up to them, asking to annex it instead. The UN was pretty much like, no, you can't do that, but South Africa did it anyway. By the late 1940s, Southwest Africa was effectively run as a South African province. But what did this actually mean? Apartheid. The South African government exported one of the world's most oppressive regimes, one that Nelson Mandela described as diabolical in its detail, inescapable in its reach, and overwhelming in its power, to their newly gained territory of Southwest Africa. This worked in favour of the few thousand German and Boer settlers, but seriously screwed over the other 90 odd percent of the territory's inhabitants, the indigenous Africans. Every aspect of their lives was regulated, scrutinized, and policed with extreme prejudice by their new overlords. The thing with systematic institutionalized oppression on a national scale is people don't like it. As the 1950s wore on into the 1960s, Southwest African resistance groups started popping up across the territory. They staged demonstrations and boycotts, and the police usually responded with bullets. One of the main resistance groups was the Southwest African People's Organization, or SWAPO. Their goal was to take back land and industry from the occupying South Africans and enact sweeping welfare, healthcare, and educational reforms. The US was on good terms with South Africa, so they did their bro a solid and declared SWAPO communist. When the real communists over in the USSR found out, they were more than happy to send military aid to Southwest Africa's border regions to prepare SWAPO for a grand revolutionary struggle. Realizing very quickly that a side had been picked for them, SWAPO fell in with the communists, although they didn't have much of a choice. With the aid of Soviet instructors, SWAPO developed a potent guerrilla force known as the Liberation Army or SWALA. From September 1965, Swala guerrillas began infiltrating Southwest Africa from secret bases in Zambia. By August 1966, the South African Defense Force were hot on their trail, tracking the insurgents to their base at Omogulog Wambashe. The inexperienced insurgents were taken by surprise by an elite force of SADF paratroopers and police. For the South Africans, Operation Blue Wildebeest, as it was known, was a minor counterinsurgency mission. But for SWAPO, it was the start of a long war for independence. The South African border war, as it was known in Pretoria, had now begun. With increasing conflict on the border, the South Africans cracked down even harder on the Namibian population. This, in turn, fed more military recruits to Swalla leading to more fighting and the cycle continued. But even with their ranks swelling and even with new armories from the Soviet Union, Swala couldn't take on the SADF in a conventional battle, so they got asymmetric. In 
After renaming themselves the People's Liberation Army of Namibia, the Freedom Fighters got to work planting landmines on SADF patrol routes. This tactic was super effective against the lightly armored paratroopers and police. PLAN also launched assaults on lightly defended regional police stations and installations. In January 1973, 50 insurgents armed with machine guns, rockets and mortars obliterated an entire police base in the Kaprivi, now Zambezi, region near Zambia. Despite being veterans of the Rhodesian Bush War, the police defenders were soundly defeated. When reports got back to Pretoria, the South Africans were furious. If the insurgents wanted a fight, the South African army was going to give it to them. Between 1973 and 1974, the SADF's budget increased by 150%. 15,000 troops rolled out along Southwest Africa's northern border, clearing and demarcating it as the cut line. SADF soldiers patrolled the cut line 24-7 looking for signs of infiltration from Angola, but Angola was having troubles of its own. In April 1974, Portugal's authoritarian dictatorship was deposed and its colonial holdings were set free. Three groups, UNITAR, FNLA and MPLA, rose to fill the power vacuum left in Angola. The MPLA was aligned with the Soviets and received huge amounts of weapons from them. This gave them the edge they needed to push UNITAR and FNLA out of Angola's capital. In response, the CIA did what it does best and started funneling weapons to the FNLA. By 1975, things were seriously heating up. For the SADF, all communists looked the same so they lumped the MPLA in the enemy pile with the PLAN. They then disguised 2,500 soldiers as mercenaries and sent them over the border to fight alongside UNITA, commanded by confirmed GigaChad Jonas Samvimbi. They had one goal. Death to the MPLA! But the MPLA had friends, and in November 1975, 12,000 Cuban soldiers showed up with heavy weapons and a full Soviet flotilla. This massive communist force crushed the CIA-backed FNLA and Zamvimbi's UNITA. The South Africans were forced to pull back to the border. The MPLA took Angola and the Soviet-backed PLAN suddenly started getting a lot more help for their fight in Southwest Africa. SWAPO chief Sam Nuoma commented, it was as if a locked door had suddenly swung open. We could at last make direct attacks across our frontier and send in forces and weapons on a large scale. PLA and guerrillas attacked the cut line regularly, but they were nearly always intercepted by small SADF patrols. The brunt of the fighting was done by these small sections, leading to this phase of the conflict becoming known as the Corporal's War. The SADF wanted to send large units over the Angolan border with armor and air support in an attempt to crush the PLAN, but the politicians were against it. The war had dragged on for over a decade now, and every time a South African body came home, it got less popular. The apartheid regime tried to sell the public on a war of communist containment, but many saw it as neo-colonial expansionism. It was getting expensive too, as South Africa had now become the primary check to communist forces backed up by the industrial might of the USSR and raw Cuban manpower. In 1978, after a spate of successful border raids by the PLAN, the SADF finally got the go-ahead to cross the border in force. As part of Operation Reindeer, 370 paratroopers of the 44th Paratroop Brigade attacked the Angolan mining town of Kasinga. The soldiers had been told it was a PLAN administrative headquarters, but this is where history gets a little murky. Swapo and the Cubans claimed that Kasinga wasn't an insurgent base, but a refugee camp that just happened to have some fighters passing through. A passing Swedish photographer noted that the camp had both facilities for refugees and a uniformed PLAN presence, insinuating that neither side was telling the whole truth. What resulted was a massacre. The SADF hit Kasinga with airstrikes, then the paratroops led a ground assault. Sources concur that they killed around 600 people. In return, 
the Paris only suffered three dead. Undoubtedly, the PLN soldiers would have put up a stout defense, but the fact that they only killed three soldiers suggests that most of those dead weren't PLAN, as South Africa claimed, but rather civilians. The international community reached a similar conclusion, and old allies like the United States and Britain openly condemned South Africa. Global opposition to apartheid was growing, and even though they were fighting the commies, no one thought the SADF were the good guys anymore. From the 70s to the late 80s, the war dragged on with no end in sight. SADF troops made repeated incursions to Angola to hunt down PLAN forces while trying to prevent those same forces doing the same to them. The Soviets refused to back down too and continued supplying top tier weaponry to the insurgents. On the ground, the SADF were more than a match for the inexperienced insurgents, but they were spread too thinly to effectively press their advantage. There was even a short ceasefire from 1984 to 1985, but that fell apart after both sides broke the rules. The final and largest battle was fought intermittently between August 1987 and March 1988 around the city of Quito Quanaval in Angola. The SADF had pushed deep into Angola and the MPLA and Cubans were pushing back. They launched a massive offensive with tanks, APCs, aircraft and thousands of troops. In front of them stood 700 SADF soldiers, along with old mate Savimbi and over 50,000 of his boys. The communists were routed, but managed to regroup in the city. For seven months, Savimbi's UNITAR and the SADF were unable to break through the communist defenses, but the MPLA and Cubans couldn't push them back either. It was a stalemate. After back and forth fighting for nearly two and a half decades, a stalemate was what everyone needed. It forced the major players to come to the negotiating table and sketch out a plan for peace. By 1989, the Cubans went home, the Soviets closed the armory, Angola was finally able to hold an election, which Zavimbi tried to start another war over when he didn't win, the South Africans pulled back to their own border, and Namibia finally got independence. As apartheid disintegrated, Namibia was finally free to govern itself, and South Africa became far more interested in domestic affairs. The border war ended on March 21st, 1990, 23 years after it began. That was the long story of the South African border war, the 23 year long war the world forgot about. But what do you think? Why do you think the SADF fought for so long, so far away from home? Why do you think Cuba was so keen to help out the MPLA? And do you think the war was simply the death throes of colonialism in Africa? Very interested to hear your thoughts on the topic, guys. Being of South African ancestry myself, I know how polarizing these topics can be, but I'm always keen to hear some more first-hand accounts of people who grew up in that time. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.